I'm really, really excited to welcome um, Eric Oliver with us. He's a regional director for CostSeg Authority, um, talking about a really niche in, in, this, in the tax code that most, I, I, I tell you, most people that I talk to have no idea that it exists, but it can save a tremendous amount of money, give you, give you so much more money right now in, in, in depreciation, front loaded, bigger deductions right now, which really gives you more money to invest in, in real estate or whatever you wanna do. So um, if, if this is your very first webinar with us, this is a big, this is a large, large seminar or webinar series that we've been going on for 10 years. Um, two weeks ago, we had Kevin O'Leary from Shark Tank on. We've had some tremendous um, talent over the years, some really good attorneys, really good presenters, um, all with a little niche in whatever it is that they do. And I think next week we've got um, a patent attorney, or two weeks, I'm sorry, um, talking about how to protect intellectual property. That would be things like patents, trademarks, copyrights. Um, right before tax season, your last minute tax strategies with former senior trial attorney from the IRS, Scott Estel. Oh, don't miss that one. That would be good. Remember tax day this year has moved from April 15th to April 18th. And then we've got, we're, we're gonna be talking about estate planning. We'll be talking about investing. We'll be talking about nonprofits. We, we got a robust webinar series. Um, all of these webinars are recorded. They're on our YouTube channel. Let me show you how that works. You simply go to YouTube and type in Protect Wealth Academy and you hit subscribe. And when you do that, what will happen is you'll get access to all of the webinars that we've taught in the past. Well, okay, not every one of them because there's literally hundreds. Um, but all, all the recent ones, the last few years. Um, and then you'll also be notified when we when we have an upcoming webinar or when we post something new. So um, please take advantage of that. It's a huge library um, that are all posted to our webinar. Hit subscribe, and then you've got access to all of that stuff. We've got a three-day summit. We had one last week. Oh my gosh, the, the, the wealth of information that came out of that summit. We had Bill Danko, co-author of The Millionaire Next Door with us. Scott Estel, um, Jill, Jill Banner is the president of iPlan Group, an IRA custodial group. She offered a free consultation for everyone just to talk about your retirement plans and, and what you can be doing. She manages hundreds of accounts. And she was talking about, here's what people are doing that she's breeding puppies in their IRA and uh, <laughs> Amazing things you, you wouldn't think that would happen. One of the best stock market traders and some of the best real estate investors, some of them that have traded billions of dollars in, or, or raised billions of dollars or managing billions of dollars. It's, it's, a, it's an amazing group. If you haven't had to attend to this summit, please put those the next two on, our, our, on your calendar. The next two are live stream events. April 25th through 27th. Then we've got one coming up in June. We are taking registrations for the April 25th through 27th event right now. If you'd like to see what, what content this is, it is, it is robust. There, there's a lot of content. In fact, if you're a CPA or if you're an attorney, most always you can get continuing education credit. It's that good, but it's not really designed for the CPA, the attorney. It's designed for regular business people, um, starting a business, running a business, investing in real estate. Um, and, and then we take you to a whole new level of, of asset protection, estate planning, income tax reduction. So now before we ever talk tax and legal, there's always, always, always gonna be a disclaimer. And you can read the whole thing, but let me summarize. We can teach general principles from stage. How this applies to you in your tax situation is really, um, we encourage you to sign up for a consultation and, and let's find out if it applies. Maybe it doesn't. Maybe, I don't know, you, 
It did so many ifs. And so don't take everything we teach carte blanche for you. And yeah, absolutely, this is what I'm going to do and start filling in your tax forms. We don't want you to do that. We want you to take every tax situation and run it past a professional. Okay, so with that, I've known Eric for, for a lot of years now. I, it, it, I don't know, it's, it's been quite a while, Eric. I, I, I remember you having hair at one point. I don't know. <laughs> it no, hasn't been um, that long, but I haven't known you yeah. that long. <laughs> um, you know what? And, and I've sent a lot of students over to him and with some amazing results. Um, this really is a niche that most of your CPAs aren't equipped to do. They can't go in and do a cost save engineer project and, 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 and say, okay, the blinds are worth this and the, and the carpet's worth this and retaining walls worth this and each tree is worth this and, and be able to get you the deductions that you really deserve. And not that necessarily you're going to take everything, but you need to know your options. If you have any real estate at all, um, I'm glad you're on. This is an important thing that everyone needs to, every real estate investor at least needs to know their options. And so with that, Eric, um, you're the expert. I'm going to shut up and let you do the teaching. And so I assume that we're going to teach for a little while and then open it up to Q&A at the end. Is that, is that the format you want to do or do you want to, yeah. no, that sounds you want to great. interrupt you every time there's a question come up or how do you want to do it? You know, I'll keep an eye on the questions um, and see what comes up. And then we will definitely take questions at the end, if that's okay. Okay. So if you have questions, you would put those into the Q&A screen, not into the chat screen. And then we'll watch the, the Q&A screen, not necessarily the chat screen. Is that fair? All right, everyone. Thank you, Eric. I appreciate your time being on here tonight to teach our students. Yeah, sure. No, thanks for having me, Don. It's, it's been a while and I, I'm glad to be here. Um, again, like Don mentioned, my name is Eric Oliver. Uh, I'm with a company called Cost Segregation Authority, and we're kind of a niche accounting firm where we just work with other accounting firms and real estate investors on accelerating their depreciation expenses through cost segregation. So um, kind of want to go through what cost segregation is. Some of you guys may know um, what cost segregation is, but want to talk about what cost segregation is. Um, talk a little bit about the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Um, that's the Trump tax uh, overhaul that you guys are um, have heard of and, and probably familiar with. And then talk a little bit about the CARES Act and how that affects depreciation um, in terms of real estate. And then what do these laws mean for you guys? So um, like Don said, if you guys have questions throughout, please feel, to, feel free to enter the questions in the q and I've got it open here on my screen. I'll try and keep an eye on it. Um, and answer those questions as they come up, um, as they pertain. So, um, all right, let's jump in. So depreciation, what is depreciation? Um, depreciation is a non-cash expense. A lot of us get into real estate for a number of purposes, but one of the benefits of real, owning real estate is the ability to reduce your tax liability. And one way you do that is through something called depreciation. So depreciation, um, Real estate is typically typically depreciated over 27 and a half years for residential properties or 39 years for commercial properties. And so just to make the math easy, let's say you buy a $275,000 um, single family rental, you would get essentially a $10,000 write-off every year against your taxable income in terms of depreciation. That's something called straight line depreciation. That's what a lot of you guys are probably doing now. You buy a property, you give your closing statement to your CPA at the end of the year, and they put that asset on the books as one asset depreciated over 27 and a half or 39 years, uh, which is great. You know, a $10,000 write-off in that example is great, but a lot of us don't own our assets for 27 and a half or 39 years. So what if we could front load some of that depreciation and take those deductions in the earlier years um, you know, there's a number of reasons why you'd want to do that. There's time value of money. There's um, inflation. You know, inflation is, is a hot topic right now. Um, a dollar today is worth way more than a dollar 39 years from now. So give me my deductions today. And the way you do that is through a cost segregation study. And what we're essentially doing is we're, if you think about it, when you buy an asset, let's just use the rental or the single family rental home for an example. When you buy a single family rental home, you're not just buying the building and the walls. And the, and the ground, the land, but you're also buying 
some carpet, you're buying some countertops, you're buying some appliances, you're buying curbs, gutters, asphalt, grass, uh, retaining walls. There's all these different components in a building. And what we do in a cost study studies, we come in and we segregate those costs into different buckets. And um, there's two type of buckets. There's what they call real property or personal property. And so for example, in that example with the $270,000 home, we're gonna come in and say of that 270, 10,000 of that is carpet, 20,000 of that is for appliances, 15,000 is for cabinets and countertops. And we segregate those costs into these buckets. The reason we do that is the IRS says that carpet, for example, should not be depreciated over 27 and a half years, but rather it should be depreciated over five years, which makes sense. Carpet doesn't last 27 and a half years. And so by putting these assets into different buckets, it allows us to accelerate our depreciation. And we'll, we'll kind of jump into an example here in just a second. Um, here's some example of those different buckets. So things that qualify as personal property over on the right, those are seven and five year assets, things like carpet, countertops, cabinetry, um, parts of the lighting, parts of the plumbing, windows, um, wall coverings. Your, those are five and seven year assets. Then you've got your 15 year bucket, and those are all of your land improvements, things like curbs, gutters, asphalt, parking lots, storm drains, irrigation, retaining walls. Um, believe it or not, but your trees, shrubs, and landscaping is all 15-year assets. So we're going to put a value to that parking lot or that driveway, and you'll be able to depreciate that concrete over 15 years versus 27 and a half or 39 years. And then your structural stuff stays in that 39 to 27 and a half year category. That's your, your walls, your doors, um, your steel structures, windows, HVAC, and parts of the plumbing and electrical. And so let's take a look at a little uh, a case study here, but we've got a $1.2 million storage unit facility. Now I failed to mention, let me back up a little bit, but you don't get to depreciate your land. So when you buy an asset, let's say you buy this for 1.2 million, or excuse me, let's say you buy this for 1.5 million. And let's say that the, the land is worth 300,000. You have to back that 300,000 out of your purchase price. And that gives you what we call your depreciable basis, just the structure itself um, and the, the land improvements. And so in this example, you've got a $1.2 million depreciable basis. Let's say you bought it in 2020 and the current tax year is 2020. We're going to go in and we're going to identify the different short-term assets. So I know there's a lot of numbers on the screen and I promise I'll explain it actually is pretty, pretty straightforward. But over on the left-hand side, you see where it says depreciation without cost segregation, that blue column on the left. If you don't do a cost segregation study on this asset, you're going to get a $30,000 write-off, $30,769 every year for the next 39 years. Um, storage units are a 39 year asset. So you're going to get a, a standard $30,000 deduction every year for the next 39 years. And let me back up a little bit. What I mean by deduction is, let's say I have 130,000 of income in 2020. Instead of being taxed on 130,000 of income, if I have this $30,000 deduction, now I'm only taxed on 100,000 of income which means if I'm in a, let's say 30% tax bracket, I just saved, you know, 30 to 30 is, I just saved $10,000 in taxes because I have this $30,000 write-off every year. So that's without cost segregation, standard straight line deduction, same deduction every year for the next 39 years. The green section is with cost segregation. So you'll see that at the bottom, we still have 1.2 million in total assets. But now we've broken that up into five, seven, and 15 year assets, and then the rest of it falls in that 39 year category. So you'll see we've got $60,000 worth of five year assets, $24,000 worth of 15 year assets, or not 24, 240,000, and then the rest of it stays at the 39 year asset, so the 900,000. So you'll see in the five year category, now we get to take that $60,000 worth of five year assets, and you're gonna divide that up basically over five years and take your deductions over five years versus the standard 39 years. So you can see why you would wanna do that because you're front loading those deductions. You're taking that 60,000 over five years versus the alternative, which is keeping it in that 39 year bucket. Same thing with the 15 year assets. Like I said, we found $240,000 worth of 15 year assets. We're gonna depreciate that over 15 years versus um, 39 years. And so you see 
over on the right hand side where it says total in that green section, you'll see those would be your deductions with a cost sake study. So in the first year, you're getting 35,000. Second year, you're getting 65,000. Third year, 55, and it slowly goes down from there. Um, in this example, if we were to take your at a $30,000, um, if we were to take it at a, your deductions, or excuse me, if you were to increase your depreciation in the first year, you would have 20,000 of increased depreciation, which is a tax savings of about 7,000. The second year you would save 12,000 in taxes. And that's that middle section on the right where it says tax savings. You can see that the first, I don't know, the first 14 years, you're gonna be saving more in taxes than you would be if you did straight line um, depreciation on the, on the left side. So I wanna make a note here. This is without something they call bonus. So this is just standard accelerated depreciation your five-year stuff, you'd appreciate over five years. Your 15 years, you'd appreciate over 15 years. Um, so talking about the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. So in 2017, Trump did an overhaul on our tax system, and a lot of things came out of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. One of the biggest things for real estate owners was bonus depreciation. And so let's talk a little bit about bonus depreciation. Bonus depreciation has been around for a number of years. You can kind of see there on the chart that it changed, the bonus percentage changed quite a number of times. And really the government would use, would use bonus depreciation or still does use bonus depreciation to help stimulate the economy. So in years where the economy was going well, they would decrease the bonus depreciation amount. In years where they needed a boost in the economy, they would increase the bonus depreciation amount. So what bonus depreciation is, is let's, it really wasn't, to be honest with you, I don't think it was thought out very, I don't think it was thought out by the politicians to use it against real estate. Because remember, real estate is a 39 year asset or 27 and a half year asset. And one of the requirements you see there over on the left is that the recovery period has to be 20 years or less. And so it really doesn't apply to your real estate. Because again, real estate's 27 and a half or 39 years. So let's just use this as, as an example. Let's say we buy a bulldozer. I buy a brand new bulldozer. I have a construction company. And if I, buy, if I bought that bulldozer in let's say 2015, so let's look at our chart here. Uh, bonus depreciation in 2015 was 50%. If I bought that bulldozer, let's say I paid a million dollars for the bulldozer. And a bulldozer is uh, normally depreciated over uh, 15 years, let's say. That bulldozer, I would be able to take 50% of my deductions, or in that case, 500,000, because remember, it's a million dollar bulldozer. I would get to take 50% of that in the first year as a depreciation amount. And the other 50% gets spread out over the next 14 years, because again, it's a 15 year asset. So that's great. We get to front load our depreciation. So this is the old tax law. This was before the, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act had to be new property. So you had to buy a brand new house or a brand new bulldozer. And the recovery period had to be 20 years or less. Again, if you think about it, you know, for real estate, it didn't necessarily apply unless you had a cost segregation study done. So the new tax law came around and a couple of things changed. The most important things that changed is now it's 100% bonus between 927 of 17 and 1231 of 2022. So that's huge. And I'll, I'll kind of walk into an example of how that works. The other thing is it no longer has to be brand new construction. So now I can go buy an existing building. Let's say it was built in 1970. It's been around for you know, 50 years. I can go buy that building, do a cost segregation study, because I'm going to break that 27 and a half year asset into five, seven, and 15 year assets. And now that five, seven, and 15 year assets are all under the 20 years or less. They have a recovery period of 20 years or less. And now I get to take 100% of that in the first year. Again, this is, this is huge. And I'll walk through this example. This is that same $1.2 million storage unit. But now you'll see in that green section, we still have the same numbers. We still have $60,000 worth of five-year assets and $240,000 worth of 15-year assets. But you'll see my five-year assets, I'm not spreading that out over five years. My 15-year assets, I'm not spreading that out over 15 years. I'm taking the full amount or 100% of that in the first year. And so you'll see that my deduction in year one on this $1.2 million storage unit is 311,000. And at a 35% tax bracket, that's 103,000 in tax savings. 
So I just got nearly half of my down payment back in the term of tax savings by doing a cost segregation study and applying the 100% bonus depreciation. So something that's, I mean, it's very powerful. I'll go back to, let me go back here. I'll, I'll just make a special note here. You see that this expires, this 100% bonus depreciation expires at the end of this year, 1231 of 2022. And so if you buy a property between now and the end of the year, that's eligible for 100% bonus. In 2023, anything you buy in 2023, it starts to phase out to 80%, meaning you'll get to take 80% of that in the first year and the other 20% over the next five or 15 years, um, et cetera. So and then it phases out 20% every year until 2027 when it's down to zero. Now, keep in mind, this is the current tax law. You know, things could change. I know the, the new administration talked briefly about getting rid of bonus depreciation. However, I don't think that will happen. They've um, already submitted a couple um, rounds of the, their first provisions and it doesn't, I don't see bonus depreciation anywhere from the Ways and Means Committee. So I don't think it's gonna make it in any final legislation, but we'll have to wait and see. But currently this is the tax law for right now. So 100% bonus through the end of this year, 80% through the end of 2023, and then it slowly goes down from there. Uh, looks like we had a question come in. What if you don't owe that much in tax? That's a great question. So let's say we go back to this example. I've got, you know, 311,000. That's that number there, that first number under the year, under where it says total in the green section. If I have a $311,000 deduction, but let's say I only make 150,000 a year, I could wipe out my, all of my income for this year and pays no taxes. And then I would have another 161,000 that would carry forward into next year. Um, that's one option. The other option is the IRS actually knew that might be a problem creating these massive deductions. And so they actually allow you to opt in or opt out of the 100% bonus. So for example, what a lot of investors will do is say, I don't need a $311,000 deduction. So I'm only going to take the bonus on my five-year assets. So I'm going to take that 60,000 but then I'm gonna let my 15 year assets, that 240,000 play out over the next 15 years. So you're basically gonna be getting 1 15th of that. So you're spreading your deductions out over 15 years. So there's a number of mechanisms you can use to almost tailor these deductions to manage your tax brackets. And so that's important. You don't always wanna wipe out all of your income. You wanna use these to get you out of those high tax brackets and into those lower tax brackets and then save some of it for subsequent years to do the same thing. Um, another great question, someone asked, how many years can you carry it forward? You can actually carry it forward indefinitely. So you never lose those deductions. They simply carry forward until you use them up. Um, so if you have low income, it may not make sense to do cost segregation because you don't want to accelerate your deductions and then turn around and have to decelerate it. I guess, I don't know if that's the right word, on the back end, meaning it's going to take you 10 years to use those deductions. Just don't pay for cost seg and take your standard deduction and and you'll be fine. And so that's really where you want to work with your tax advisor to kind of walk through that and see what is your income, what kind of deductions do you have, and does cost segregation make sense in the current year? Um, let's see, going on here. Um, so we talked about that $100,000 tax savings. So bonus depreciation, like I said, very powerful um, and can be utilized, it, it really opened the door for cost segregation to be utilized on much smaller assets. In the past, cost segregation, and some of you have probably experienced this with your um, CPAs where you say, hey, I've got a couple of rental properties, should I do cost segregation? And you may have been told, hey, they're too small or cost segregation only is applies to buildings over a million dollars in basis. And that used to be the case before bonus depreciation. Now it's really we do cost segregation studies on anything from residential rentals up to large ski resorts. So, um, you know, it's definitely worth looking at in terms of if you've got a tax liability and own real estate, now's a good time to, to possibly utilize that cost segregation study. All right. So one question we get asked often is, hey, um, I have never heard of cost segregation. I've got these properties, but I bought them back in 2017. Can I go back and do a study on properties that I've already put on a tax return? And the answer is yes, you can. And the IRS actually allows you to do that without ever having to amend any tax returns. And so it's something called a catch-up benefit. And you get to take all that missed depreciation you should have taken. In that example, if I bought it in 17, 
all that missed depreciation from 17, 18, 19, and 20, and I get to drop it on the current tax year, the 2021 tax year. And so um, it requires a form. It's an IRS form 3115. Um, we provide that as part of our services. Most cost segregation companies do provide, um, they either will charge you or they'll provide it as part of their service, but you need a 3115 tax form. It's a change in accounting method. And basically that form just tells your, tells the IRS that, hey, I've been taking my standard straight line depreciation for the last four years. I'm now gonna change the way I do my depreciation to an accelerated method. And here's the difference in those numbers. And so um, we'll go through a little case study here. Um, real quick, I've got a question here. Can this apply for individual homes? Yes, not your primary residence though. So you cannot do cost segregation on a primary residence where you live, but any revenue generating property where you collect rent, you can do cost segregation. Um, what kind of assets, uh, let's, let me slide this over. I got one more question. What kind of assets can you do this with? Can a study be done on cars or trucks? Um, so you do get to take depreciation on cars and trucks that are used for business purposes, but you don't need a study because you know the value of that car or truck based on what you paid for it. <coughs> so there's no need to segregate out the different components of a car or truck. So if you buy a $30,000 truck, then you get to take $30,000 worth of depreciation based on the useful life of the truck. Um, there in the law with trucks or cars used for business purposes. I don't have those off the top of my head, but you do get to take bonus depreciation in certain circumstances and on certain vehicles. Um, check with your CPA on that. Um, all right, let me go to the next slide here. Um, let's see. Um, oops, let me go back here. So um, Here's that same $1.2 million property, but now let's say we bought it in 2015 and we're doing our taxes for 2020. So now we've owned it for five years. You'll see the numbers are all the same. Um, it's just that you get to take in that first red circle there, all that depreciation, the difference between the depreciation on the left where it says depreciation without cost segregation versus the numbers on the right, you get to take all of that in the first year without having to amend any returns, which is great. So this, in this example, you're getting a hundred, let's say you bought it in 2015 for 1.2 million. You do the cost sake study in 2020, you get to take $123,000 um, increase over your standard deduction. And so you take that, apply that to your taxable income, um, great way to reduce your taxes. Um, we've got a couple more questions here. Um, do you have any suggestions for partnerships? Um, I'm not sure um, what the question is. Maybe we can get some more clarification. I don't know if you're looking for CPA partnerships or um, partnerships for cost segregation. Um, so maybe you can reach out after the, the presentation and maybe just clarify. Um, so yeah. Eric, it, I, yeah. I think what she's asking is if I have a rental property in a partnership, does cost can cost segregation? So if it's in an LLC or a limited partnership, cost seg still works. Yeah, absolutely. So the way that works is let's say me and Don own a property together. Let's say we own this, this storage unit. I would get part of that depreciation would kick down to me through the K-1 and part of it would kick down to Don. And so we would get our share through the K-1s. You, you would see a big negative number on your K-1, which would then flow onto your personal tax return. So but it yes. works exactly the same, whether it's in a partnership or whether it's in your personal name, yep. because the partnership is a pass-through entity. That's correct. Okay. Uh, I had another good question. After you sell the asset, can the benefit apply to the new owner? And so you would need a cost segregation study done every time the property changes ownership. And the reason for that is because the cost basis changes. So if I buy it for 1 million and I do a cost seg study and I sell it five years later for 1.5, now a cost seg study needs to be done by the new owner to segregate those costs at the $1.5 million purchase price. And so, yeah, so cost seg studies get done once per property per owner. Um, once it changes hands, the cost basis changes. And so a new study would need to be done at that time. Um, range storage, storage building, can I cost seg? I have a farm and I'm building grain storage and storage buildings. Can I cost seg them? Yes, you definitely can. 
Um, it would be worth looking at. We would want to look and see what type of assets were in there. Um, and I should state this, I should have stated this earlier, but most cost segregation companies will run what they call a benefit analysis before ever engaging anybody to do business. And the whole point of that is let's take a quick look at it to make sure that there's substantial items in there that we can segregate and that you're going to have substantial tax savings. If not, you know, if you don't have a lot of income, let's say it's a, a low income year, we're going to advise you, hey, don't do cost segregation this year, keep it in your back pocket and do it in a future year. And so we get on the phone, we put together some initial numbers and um, give you an idea of what the potential tax savings would be long before you ever engage us to do a study. Um, and so, um, yeah, we would definitely want to look at the grain storage on the farm and see if that would be uh, worth doing a cost segregation on. Agricultural equipment has kind of unique categories where there's some, some great benefits there. Um, last question here, if I turn my primary residence into a rental, will the cost segregation study apply? Yes, it will apply. However, the IRS is pretty savvy about that and they won't allow you to take bonus depreciation. And so um, you can accelerate your deductions, you just won't be eligible for bonus. Otherwise, all of us would do that with our primary residence. We would rent it out to a family member for six months, take all the bonus depreciation, then move back in. And so um, you can definitely do a cost segregation study, but it does eliminate you or disqualify you from taking bonus. All right, let's move on here. Um, all right, so when would you do a study? Um, that's a great question. So if you currently own any income properties, so you could do a catch-up study on that. Um, if you purchase an existing building or build a new building, you would want to do a cost segregation study on that. If you renovate, remodel, or make leasehold improvements, um, before a sell, which is kind of an interesting one, and I'll explain to you here why in a second, um, property with any type of step up. So if you inherit a property or you buy a partner out of a property and you have new basis in that property, um, that would be a time you would wanna look at doing a cost segregation study. So let's talk a little bit about when you sell an asset, um, cause this is a question we get quite often. When you sell an asset, you pay two types of tax. You pay capital gains tax and you pay recapture tax. The recapture tax is calculated based on the amount of depreciation you take. And so oftentimes people will ask us, hey, why do I wanna accelerate my depreciation if I'm just gonna have a bigger tax bill when I sell the asset? Because you know I'm gonna have more depreciation than I took, which means I'm gonna have more recapture tax. And how does that all play out? And so without getting too far in the weeds, you're going to, if essentially what you're doing in a cost seg study is you're taking the deduction at the highest possible tax rate. So you're taking your deduction against your ordinary income rate, paying back a portion of it when you sell the asset at a lower rate and saving the spread. And so there's like, again, a number of reasons why you would do that. There's time value of money, there's cash flow, um, taking the deduction at the high rate, paying it back at the lower rate. There's an arbitrage there of anywhere from, you know, 15 to 17%, depending on your tax bracket. And you can actually reduce or eliminate recapture on personal property. So let me walk you through an example here. And bear with me here because I know there's a lot of numbers here. It only took me three years to figure this slide out. So I don't expect you to figure it out in the next 30 seconds. But just bear with me here. Typical real estate transaction. You buy an apartment building in 2015. You bought it for $2.5 million. And you sold it five years later for $3.3 million. Right? So you're thinking, that's great. I made $800,000 on the transaction. Well, once you sell that asset, at the end of the year, the IRS is going to ask for their portion of those proceeds. And so you'll see, um, and again, I'm not going to go through all the numbers here, but the number that you need to know is down at the bottom, which is you're going to pay $285,000 in taxes to the IRS on that transaction. Bought it for $2.5 sold it five years later for 3.3, you're going to pocket five and you're going to send three to the IRS is basically what happens. This is without doing cost segregation. There's transactions like this happening all over the country right now. You've got to send that money to the IRS at the end of the year. And again, you can see, uh, I don't have the pointer here, but down on the left-hand side, you see that there's two taxes where it says recapture of depreciation at 25%. So you owe 125,000 there. And then underneath that, it says capital gains at 20%, you owe 160,000 there. 
So those two numbers together add up to the 285 that you're gonna have to pay on this transaction, right? That's a tough check to write to the IRS. But I guess if you're writing that check to the IRS, that means you're making money. So that's a good thing. But I don't ever wanna to have to write a $285,000 check to the IRS. Exact same example, but this time you've done cost segregation. So now the numbers are the same, but now we've segregated it into the different buckets. <coughs> Excuse me. And so let me ask a question. When you segregate that, so you bought the property in 2015, you did a cost seg study. We identified the five-year assets. And in this example, um, you'll see it's 425,000. Um, that's over the second column from the right in the green section, you'll see where it says 425. So what are those five-year assets worth after owning the building for five years? They're worth zero, right? They're fully depreciated. They have no value, which makes sense. It's carpet. Your carpet doesn't last for more than five years typically. And so you fully depreciated it. So you essentially have no basis in that carpet, which means you pay no recapture on that carpet. Now your 15 year assets, you've only owned it for five years. So your 15 year assets still have roughly two thirds worth of their value left. So you pay some recapture on those, but not a lot. And so at the end of the day, when this is all said and done, the number down on the right hand side is your tax bill. So on this trans exact same transaction, but now you've done cost egg, your total tax bill is 203 versus if you remember on the previous slide, it was 285. So you've saved $82,000 in taxes and you've had that money to play with or to reinvest or to buy a boat or pay down debt, whatever you wanted to do with it over the last five years, you've had that money to be able to do that. And then when you settle up with the IRS, when you sell the, the, um, the building, you don't have to pay as much in taxes. And so to simplify, I'm gonna, again, try and back into this just to simplify it and keep it out of the weeds. But when you don't do cost segregation, let's say you bought this building for, and we're gonna change the numbers here just to, for visual purposes, but let's say you bought it for a million and five years later, you sold it for 2 million. So it doubled in value. If you don't do cost segregation, you're telling the IRS when you go pay your, your tax bill on that, you're telling them that everything doubled in value. Your land is worth double, your structure is worth double, and so is your dirty old five-year-old carpet. Well, carpet doesn't go up in value, carpet goes down in value. And so you shouldn't be paying a gain on your carpet. You're not gonna sell your carpet for more than you bought it for five years earlier, right? Your carpet's basically worth zero. It's stained, it's dirty, it's five years old. And so that's what happens when you do cost segregation is you're able to allocate your sales price, your new sales price to the right buckets. And so you're not paying gain on stuff that you shouldn't be paying gain on. And so hopefully that simplifies these whole two slides. Cause like I said, there's a lot of number here, but if you can remember two things, take your deduction at a high rate, pay a portion of it back at a lower rate and save the spread. That's the first thing. And the second thing is don't ever sell your carpet for more than you bought it for. And if you don't do cost segregation, that's what you do. If your property goes up in value, you're paying gain on that whole asset because you don't have it broken out into different parts. You just have one big asset, right? And so you have to tell the IRS that whole big asset doubled in value. And the IRS says, okay, well, it doubled in value. So pay us on the whole gain, not just a portion of the gain. And that's why it's important to break out your, your property into the correct, correct buckets. Um, got a couple questions here. Let's see. Um, if you sell at say year five and benefited fully, do you have to pay back some of the, oh yeah, we just kind of went through that. That was a great question. Um, we basically just went through that, but yes, if you take your full deduction and sell it after five years, you pay a portion of that back at a lower rate on a lesser amount and save the spread. Um, will there be a replay? Um, Don, I think you can answer that. I do believe Don records all these. They'll be on his YouTube page. Um, Correct me if I'm wrong, Don, but I do believe they'll it, be it will be available tomorrow. Okay. And so you can go through these numbers again. It usually takes us well, at least a, a half a day to, to reformat it and edit out all the, you know, bleep out, out all the swear words. No, I can't. No. I think but, Don's going to put a little powder on my head too to get this glare off my head, but. No, he's a good editors at his company. So, <laughs> so tomorrow it'll be available on our YouTube channel. And anyone who registered for this webinar, you'll also watch for an email from us because 
the, the full recording will come to you in an email, or at least a link will come to it. So if you registered, you'll get, you'll get an email from us. Yes, it's being recorded. Okay, perfect. And, and I did notice, Don, a few people did uh, ask questions in the chat, so I'll just address those real quick. Okay. Um, just, re just remember, if you want to ask a question, try and put it in the Q&A, because that's the one we're, we're monitoring. But um, I do see a couple here in the chat. Can mobile home parks utilize cost segregation? Absolutely. Um, those are great assets. Um, oftentimes, if you buy a million dollar mobile home park, and let's say the land is worth 300,000, so you have 700,000 of basis, that whole 700,000 or a good portion of that 700,000 can be reclassified to a 15 year asset. And you get to take all that deduction in year one. So if you have a high income year or you're pulling money out of a 401k and you're going to have to realize that income, mobile home parks are kind of a unique category yeah. where there's not necessarily a structure there. And really what you're buying is 15 year land improvements. You're buying trailer services and those trailer services can be depreciated over 15 years, which means they're eligible for bonus, which means you get to write off almost the whole amount in the first year, which is kind of crazy in some instances. So um, great question on the mobile home parks. Um, There's a question from Daniel and maybe I can answer that. Yeah. Are there any government rehab loans available to fix up properties in bad shape? And we had a we had a gentleman on last Thursday night um, talking about grants, loans, scholarships available, and oh my gosh, there is so much federal money out there and state money, and sometimes there's there's you know the family foundations, um, that type of private money. But the, the answer is yes, Daniel. If you can't find that that um, that recording on our YouTube channel, call us tomorrow at the office. Um, the number, let me put that in your chat screen, is the number for our office, and we can, we can hook you up with that webinar. It's 800-276-1430 is the number for our office. Okay. Perfect. A uh, couple of quick questions. Um, can you still, do, can you do a 1031 exchange? Um, absolutely. So you do the cost seg study and you basically it's great when you do a 1031 exchange because there's no recapture, there's no capital gains. All that tax gets pushed into the new property. Um, an investment strategy we see a lot of people do is buy a property, 1031 exchange, 1031 exchange, 1031 exchange. And unfortunately we all have to die at some point. And then we pass the property on to our heirs. They get a step up in basis and nobody pays tax. And so, um, you know, great opportunity there. Um, can this be done after 30 years of ownership? The answer is typically not um, because you've already taken 30 years worth of depreciation. So there's not a lot there left for us to accelerate. Um, anything over about 15 years of ownership is probably not worth it, but we would wanna run the analysis just to make sure. Um, let's see, if I sold my rental unit less than the price I bought from 15 years ago, do I still pay capital gains tax? Potentially, it depends on how much you've depreciated. Um, and what your basis was at the time of sell, whether or not you have to pay capital gains tax on that. Um, in, the, in the future, guys, if you would put your, your questions in the Q&A box, it makes it easier for us to manage this. So we're yeah. going to use the chat screen just for me to communicate to you, but use the Q&A screen if you would. Yeah. Okay. And then uh, two more questions real quick. Does cost segregation work on renovation projects? Yes. So depending on the size and scope of the renovation, it may be worth having a cost segregation study done. Um, if you're going to do, you know, if you buy a, a single family rental and you're going to put a new roof and a new deck on it, you probably don't need a cost seg study to, to tell you what the value of that deck and roof are because you're going to contractor, just give those invoices to your CPA. But if you have, uh, you know, if you're gutting a place and you're putting a new electrical, new plumbing, um, it's definitely worth having somebody look at it to see if it, it makes sense. Um, inherited properties, that's a great question. Someone asked about inherited properties. Yes, cost segregation definitely applies to inherited properties. That's that step up we're talking about. And it's kind of a two for one, depending on how you inherited the property. If there was a death and you inherited it, you would want to do a cost seg study so that it would reduce the taxable income on the final tax return of the deceased. And then also you would want to do the tax or excuse me, the cost segregation study when you inherit it so that you can lower your taxable um, tax liability at the same time. So, so great question. 
All right, I know there's a couple more questions. I'm gonna continue on here and then we'll see how much time we have left on to, to answer these other questions. Um, I don't think there's a whole lot of other slides, but let's just continue on here. Once we get through the slides, we'll go back to the, to the questions here. Um, all right, so let's talk a little bit about, and that was pretty much all I've got about cost segregation. So hopefully that kind of clears up any misconceptions or gives you a better idea of how cost segregation works. There was a few more or a few other tax benefits that came out of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act and then later the coronavirus stimulus packages. Um, one of them is a 45L tax credit. I just want to touch on because it's probably one of the, the most overlooked tax credits for um, residential or apartment owners and builders. And what it is, is it's a $2,000 tax credit per dwelling unit. So if you have a duplex, you get a $4,000 tax credit. If you have an eightplex, it's a $16,000 tax credit. But this is a little bit different than the deductions we were talking about earlier. This is actually a dollar for dollar tax credit. And so this comes right off your tax bill. Now, to be eligible for the 45L tax credit, it is on new construction or renovated construction, but you have to really basically gut the place and, and redo it in order to be eligible. Because what it is, is it's an energy credit and it has to be your dwelling has to be 50% more efficient than I believe it's 2011 standards, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and so we go in and we actually will model it. You have to have a third party come in and look at the property. We will model it and we will look at it and say, okay, is the heating and air conditioning more efficient? Is, it, is the lighting more efficient? Is the envelope of the building, the, the insulation in the walls and in the roof and in the windows, is it more efficient? And once we do our modeling, and if everything qualifies, then you get a, a certificate that allows you to take a two thousand dollar tax credit um, off your, or two thousand dollar tax credit off your tax bill. Which again, so this is more for people who are building new projects or who are going in and, and doing full gut jobs on new projects. Because even if you, sometimes people will call me and say, "Hey, am I eligible for the credit? I just put in, you know, energy efficient appliances and a new toilet that uses less water." And unfortunately, it's a lot more in depth than that. You really would have to go in and change the insulation, put in new windows, put in new insulation in the attic. Um, so we do some renovations, but mostly on new construction. And the great thing with new construction is just by nature of the county tax laws, a lot of counties require you to put in high efficiency stuff. And so most units do qualify. Um, there are some parts of the country that use different types of heating and air where it, it's harder to qualify but um, most of them are pretty efficient nowadays. And so um, definitely worth looking at. I will mention on this 45L tax credit, it was not extended for 2022. And so um, anything through 2018 through 2021 is still eligible. The uh, hopes are that this will get extended um, once the administration gets around to, to looking at the tax policy. I think that this, these energy credits usually get bipartisan support um, you've got one side of the aisle that's looking for tax breaks. You've got another side of the aisle that's looking for green energy um, or green efficiency initiatives. And so usually they come together on this and, and it should get uh, passed going forward. But as of right now, it's not on the books as being eligible for anything built in 2022. But stay tuned. Uh, keep an eye because like I said, I, my guess is as they get around to revising their tax plan, I, I do think this will be in there. Um, all right, so next is the is a 179D tax deduction. So I should have stated the 45L is for residential properties only. It doesn't apply to commercial properties. The 179D does apply to both commercial and large residential. So in order to qualify for the 45L, your residential property has to be under three stories. So it can't be more than three stories above grade. If it is more than three stories, if you build a high rise, then you're eligible for the 179D tax deduction, which gives you a $1.80 per square foot deduction. Now that's uh, $1.80 can be broken up into three different parts, three different 60 cent parts. One is for the lighting, two is for the mechanical, and three is for the envelope. And so um, unlike the 45L where it's all or nothing, this 179D, you may qualify for either 60 cents, $1.20, or even $1.80 per square foot um, of the building. And again, it's very similar. 
in terms of you're looking at, like I said, the lighting, the envelope, and then the heating and air. And the nice thing about the 179D is this is was made permanent. And so it is good for the 2022. And also you don't have to amend your tax returns. You can fill out one of those 3115 change in accounting methods and you can um, take it retroactively without having to amend any tax returns. So um, two great deductions that, like I said, are probably some of the most underutilized. I think for the 45L, because it's some years it's here, some years it's not. And so I think a lot of people forget about it because it's not something that's always available. Uh, but definitely, you know, if you think about it, you, if you're building units or you're a builder, um, it could be significant because those are dollar for dollar tax credits. So, um, all right, Don, I've got a couple of questions here. Let's open it up for question C. At what point in time does cost seg done? Okay, so somebody asked, at what point in time is the cost seg study done in regards to filing taxes and selling the home? I own two rentals when my CPA files the taxes. What separates the two properties for the IRS? So um, you want to do the cost seg study. The hard thing with that question is there's a lot of variables. So you want to do the cost seg studies in years where you have high income because you really want to use those deductions to offset your highest taxable income to bring you down into those lower tax brackets. So we do have some investors that buy properties. They maybe are always in the highest tax bracket. So they buy the properties. They send us their closing statements. We do the cost seg studies right away. Um, other investors will maybe hold on to them and maybe do one or two a year to bring their taxable income down and then save their other properties and maybe do those next year or the following year. So, um, you know, that's a, a good question for your tax preparer. Um, be happy to help you out after the call if we, if we have time. But um, let's see, the next question is, is it possible to do our own cost seg studies or the IRS require a certified study to be done? That's a great question. So there is no governing body for cost segregation studies. You don't have to have a special certificate. However, the IRS does issue an audit guide. And in the audit guide, it says that a trained professional needs to do the study. And it's kind of one of those things where you don't want to do your own study because the IRS is just going to assume that you're going to be super aggressive. And so I wouldn't recommend you doing your own study. And unless you have both tax knowledge and constructional engineering knowledge, you're probably going to leave a lot of deductions on the table. And so most of the time, I don't know. I know of a few CPAs that attempt to do their own cost seg studies. And I'll be honest with you, they don't have the expertise. And so they end up for example, they may say, okay, that washer and dryer is worth $3,000. So they'll give you a $3,000 deduction as a five-year asset. But what they don't know is that not only do you get to take that washer and dryer, but the electrical that's going to that washer or that laundry room, as well as the plumbing that's going to that laundry room is only going to that laundry room because it's specific for a five-year asset, that washer and dryer. And so that's what we do is we actually will we'll put a value to that and say, okay, of all the electrical work in this building, what is the cost to put in that electrical work for that laundry room? And we can put a value to that. And so I've seen CPAs try and do their own cost seg studies and they usually come back at somewhere between 10 and 15% segregation versus having a cost seg company do it, you're gonna get somewhere between 25 and 35% segregation. So you pay a little bit more to have the study done, but your tax savings is gonna be tenfold, which is gonna cover the additional fee to have the study done. And so, um, you know, definitely look at, the best thing to do would be to, to look at both of them and say, okay, here's the fee for this study. Here's what my deduction would be. Here's the fee for this study. Here's what my deduction would be. And it's, and then you can compare and see where the overall tax savings is. Um, what is the cost for a study? That's a great question. So the cost for the studies vary depending on the size and scope of the project. So we do anything from single family rentals for $2,500 up to ski resorts for $200,000 for the study. You know, they got multiple buildings and restaurants. And, and so I know that's a wide range, but our average study is about $6,000 to $7,000. Um, but again, you'll wanna see, you know, at least a 10X return on that in terms of tax savings. And so um, most cost segregation companies, like I mentioned, will give you a free analysis. So. Um, we'll show you how to reach out here in a second, but you can reach out. We'll give you a price for the study as well as what your expected tax savings would be. And then you can decide if it makes sense from there. Um, if you have a rental property, can you move in and live there for a couple of years and get rid of the recapture tax? Um, 
I don't believe you can. That's a good question for your CPA, but I don't believe you can. You can, if you start out as a rental and you take the, and you do a cost take study and take the depreciation, even if you move back into that, let's say you move back into that property for 10 years, when you sell it in 10 years, you still have a taxable event at that 10 years, no matter how long you've lived there, because you've taken depreciation on it. So that's my understanding, but I would just confirm that with, with your CPA. Um, let's see. Uh, last question here. In the scenario of a 1031 into a 1031 into a 1031, and you eventually 1031 into a single family rental that you would eventually like to live in. Um, I don't know that I understand. Let me just read the question out loud and then um, I'll try to answer it. But in the scenario of doing a 1031 into a 1031 into a 1031, and you eventually 1031 into a single family rental that you would eventually like to live in, can you roll that final 1031 into a single family rental you plan to hold as a rental initially, then convert to a primary resident? I think that was kind of the same question where if you have it as a rental, and then you make it your primary, can you avoid some of that recapture? And I, I don't believe the answer is yes. I believe the answer is no. You can defer that until you move out of the property, but once you sell that asset, then you would have to recapture at that point. Yeah, the only way, Douglas, the only way I know how to do that is, is either to die, like Eric mentioned, you, you've done a 1031 to a 1031, 1031, 1031, but you keep the original basis. There's two ways to avoid the taxes on that. Moving, putting that as a personal residence and claiming your $250,000, that doesn't work. But, but what would work is either pass away and the kids inherit it at a step-up basis, or at that time would be a good time maybe to look at a charitable remainder trust and, and all, the, all the capital gains go away at that point. But moving into the home and trying to claim that Two hundred fifty or or five hundred thousand dollar personal residence exemption, mm, nice try, but no, I don't think it works. Yeah, I don't. I don't believe so. Yeah. Um, all right. Another question: If I do a full rehab on a with a flip, added insulation in the attic, um, new lights, is it eligible for the forty five L credit? Possibly. So you would want to um, get with a company like our, either us or somebody else. Give them the information of what equipment you put in there, and then they would be able to tell you whether it's not. Um, I built a two unit condo from the ground up and sold both condos last year. Will I be eligible to take the 45 L tax credit? If the answer is yes, is it possible to use this tax credit with eligible tax credit like energy efficient appliances, et cetera? Yes, you can. The answer to that is yes, you can take the 45 L tax credit and it is eligible with other tax credits like your energy efficiency appliances. Um, you would have to amend because you sold the condos last year. So remember that 45L, you would have to amend. And so you would want to see if it was worth amending, but you could possibly look at that um, 45L credit on that on that building. Hey, Eric, why don't you finish your presentation? Then we're going to come back because we're going to get we're going to get a lot more questions as, as you okay. finish. Sure. And I'm just the whoops, let me what happened here? Give me one second here. All right, I just have a few more slides. Um, one is talking about the new administration. Um, you know, the, the new administration, they talked a lot, you know, in the elections about changes that were gonna be made. Um, I think with the coronavirus and now we've got Ukraine going on, there hasn't been a lot of changes in terms of tax policy. I do think it's coming. Um, a couple of things that were talked about is raising the corporate tax rates from 21% to 26.5%. Um, a 3% surcharge on a gross adjusted gross income over 5 million. So Don, that affects you. That doesn't affect me because I don't make that much money, but <laughs> just kidding, Don. Uh, Long-term capital gains could go up from 20% to 25%. Um, tax rates for high income earners go up. The highest tax bracket right now for federal is 37%. They've talked about raising that up to 396 and then there was talks originally about 1031 exchanges, um, um, getting rid of those altogether. I don't think that's going to happen. The real estate lobby is too powerful. And um, like I said, that was never mentioned in their initial proposals that they've put out so far. And so, I, again, I don't, that would just shut down a lot of the transactions that are happening if they got rid of 1031 exchanges. So I don't think that's going to happen, but uh, we're keeping a close eye on that as well. Um, 
All right, so how to proceed. So again, I talked a lot about a free benefit analysis. Um, if you actually go to protectwealth.com forward slash cost seg, they have on the website a form that you can fill out that comes directly to us and we can provide that benefit analysis. It doesn't cost you guys anything. It'll give you an idea of whether or not your property makes sense to do a cost segregation study on. And you can take our analysis. I would recommend you take our analysis to your CPA and say, hey, I've got these deductions available to me. Is this a good year for me to do the cost seg? Because we just know a little bit of information. Your CPA has the big picture and says, well, um, you know, you've got these carry forward deductions from last year or whatnot. So um, get an analysis done, um, share it with your CPA, and then you can determine whether or not cost segregation makes sense for you um, in the given year. And so I think with that, Don, I don't have anything else, Don. If there's anything else you want me to cover, let me know. Well, just a comment, because sure. we've sent some people to you over the, the years, and, and maybe a cost seg on a single family is, is $4,000. Oh, my gosh, that's $4,000. Well, you re keep in mind that they don't want you to do this unless it's going to save you 10 times. So if it saves you $40,000 in taxes, I, I paid the four thousand dollars any any day of the year. That that's that's really what we're looking for because we're not looking at saving. We're not, this isn't like keeping a mileage log. And oh my gosh, I forgot to count these 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 ten miles. I it's going to screw up my taxes. Uh, these are big deductions, and for real estate investors, this is a really big thing. Now the only the, the, one of the questions that I get all the time and. And Eric, maybe you can help me out with this one. Does sure. this apply to, I, I've got several properties in my IRA. Does this apply to that? That's a good question. No, it doesn't because you're not paying tax on those properties at the current moment. So no, you don't want to do cost segregation on properties that are held in your IRA. So if it's in an IRA or a 401k or a corporate pension plan, everything we've talked about here, it's a tax-free environment. So there is no depreciation and you don't get bonus depreciation or any of that because you're in a tax-free environment. And that's gooder -er than, than all the stuff that we're doing here. Right. Is, is that fair? Okay. Yes, that is fair. Okay. Let, let's finish on some questions. Sure. Um, if I move out of a home and rent it out, can you do a cost egg study even if you've owned the home for 20 years? So yes, you can do a cost seg study. So let's say I bought a home 20 years ago and I moved out last year and made it a rental. Um, I could do a cost seg study, but remember your starting depreciation or your depreciable basis goes to the value you paid for it 20 years ago. And so if you bought it for 50,000 and it's now worth 300,000, it may not be worth doing a cost seg because remember, we have to go off the original purchase price in terms of the depreciation. So Again, um, we would fill out the form. We would want to run an analysis to see if it makes sense. But um, you can definitely do it. Whether or not it would make sense would be dependent upon um, uh, how long you bought it and what you paid for it and when it became a rental. Um, and I, I do need to note that I think I mentioned when you move out of a primary and turn it into a rental, it excludes you from that bonus depreciation. So just keep that in mind. Um, can you do cost segregation studies remotely? That's a great question. Um, a year ago, I would have told you no, and then coronavirus hit, and we all had to relearn how to do things, <laughs> and there was travel restrictions, and we couldn't get anywhere, and we learned how to do these remotely, so that's a great question. So we do some of our residential rentals or our smaller projects we will do remotely. Um, we essentially set up something similar to a Zoom call where we've got one of our costing engineers on one end, either yourself or a property manager on the other end, and we walk through the property together. We ask to see certain components that we need to see for to conduct the study, you know, show us the electrical panels, show us the flooring in the kitchen. There's certain things we need to see. Um, so it's a great way to get them done. Um, it keeps the out-of-pocket costs down for you guys as the building owners. Um, and we're able to do those uh, fairly efficiently um, as well. So um, what is the basis if you turn your primary residence into a rental? So if you turn your primary residence into a rental, your basis is uh, what you paid for it when you bought it as your primary. So again, if I buy a home, if I bought a home 20 years ago and I paid 300,000, even if it's worth a million dollars today and I turn it into a rental today, your basis is 300,000 and your 
in service date would be today as a rental. So and that would exclude you from bonus depreciation. Um, I think that's everything. I think I- um, Okay, can, now, we got more questions up? in the chat screen. Let's, oh, <laughs> yeah, let's, let's go over there and start at the bottom. Sure. If a house was bought in October, can a cost seg be done now? Sure, absolutely. And you can absolutely. actually you can actually still apply it to your 2021 tax return because really we have until October to get these cost seg studies done for those of you who extend. Um, and actually, if you call me before tomorrow at midnight, we can still get it done for April 15th, but tomorrow's our cutoff date. So um, if you're still trying to file for April 15th, you got to make moves really quick. If you plan on extending, we really have until um, all the way to October 15th to do your cost seg study and apply it to your 2021 taxes. Or you could file it and then amend, could you not? Um, possibly. Um, not if you have to do that 3115 tax form. So if you bought it in 2021 and want to do the study in 2021, yes, you can go back and amend. But let's say I've got a property that I bought in 2014 and I want to use it on my 21 taxes, you would have to make sure that's done before October 15th because that form, that 3115 change in accounting method, you're not allowed to submit that on a, an amended return after the date. Um, so here's what I like about what Eric's offering is that it's a free analysis. If you've got a property and, and, and where I see this, somebody wants to build or somebody wants to invest in a new property. Well, let's take your existing three properties. Let's do a cost seg on those. Let's get a bigger deduction this year. That gives you more money to invest with this new property. I see this done with, especially with residential assisted living. Uh, well, I've got three houses over here. Let's do a cost seg on those. Or I've got a commercial property. Let's do a cost seg on that. Now I've got more money to invest in my residential assisted living. Right. It, 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 it's an amazing way to, to you remember it, how you used to play, pay, play Monopoly? And sometimes you had a couple of little dead properties that aren't making money. Mortgage those suckers, get the money out of them, and put it into hotels and motels and, and, and make money. It, it's like, <laughs> for me, it's, it, it's kind of a no-brainer. And what Eric's offering is a chance to do a cost seg, or a, a, not, not the whole analysis, but look at the property um, and it, and look at it and go, yeah, this would be a really good candidate. Or no, this, you really, you have, you're not going to get a lot by this. It's a perfect way. There we go. <laughs> so I wasn't moving enough, there. apparently. They didn't know I was still in the room. It's got these motion sensored lights. <laughs> so it's a perfect way. If you have real estate and you're looking to expand your portfolio or save money on taxes, this is like, a huge no-brainer. Yeah. No, Don, Don, and I'll just add to that. Um, you know, I was recently at a conference and they were talking about cost segregation and we're going to pay the money out either way. So you're, if, you, if, you, if you made, let's just say you made $200,000 this year, you're going to pay 60000 of that to the IRS. Do a cost seg study and take that tax savings, that 60000 that you were going to pay to the IRS and go invest it as a down payment on a new property and now you're creating wealth. It's, you're going to pay the 60000 either way, but you might as well put it into a revenue generating property that's going to add wealth to your end game versus just paying it to the IRS. A lot of us just settle with, eh, it's a hassle. We just end up paying that money to the IRS. But with these bonus depreciation laws, Don, you can basically get your down payment back by doing a cost seg study. And so do the cost segs, buy a property, do a cost seg study, and you're going to get all that tax savings back, which basically covers a good portion of your down payment. Absolutely does. All right. What, what other question did we get? Um, I think we oh, got there. Right. There was one other question about if you did a $500,000 rehab job to your primary residence to get it ready for a cost seg or uh, ready for a rental property, does that add to your basis? And the answer is yes. As long as your intent was to do those improvements, you didn't do it and live in it. You know, I didn't buy it in 2014, spend 500,000 to fix it up for myself and then turn it into a rental in 2021. You would have to have spent that money specifically for the rental activity. 
And if so, then you can add those to your basis potentially um, and, and increase the basis that way. So, well, and, and two, on an investment property, what, what's going to happen is your, your CPA is going to want to separate. These were repairs and these were improvements. Right. And repairs, I get to deduct right now, right. This, this year. Improvements is, okay, I build on a garage. Um, that kind of, I went from asphalt to maybe tile roof, or I went from linoleum to, to granite. Those would be improvements. But if the carpets and anything that's considered to be a repair, oh, that's another huge deduction right now this year. Right. Yep. And there's actually a safe harbor um, where anything under $2,500, you can immediately expense. So the IRS basically says, even if you were to buy a $2,500 $2, worth of flooring, um, let's say you bought $2,400, so it has to be under $2,500, you wouldn't have to necessarily capitalize that because it's under that safe harbor. It's not worth everyone's time putting it on a depreciation schedule. And so anything under any repair or maintenance under $2,500, you just immediately expense, which is great. Okay. So what's Eric's contact information? Go to protectwealth.com forward slash cost seg. Give them that information and, they'll, and somebody from cost seg will get in touch with you. That's the best way to get in touch with you is yeah. sign up for a free analysis. Yeah. And even if you don't have a property, but have a question, just fill out that form. That'll give me the, the notification that you're interested in information. And I can um, either myself or someone on our team will give you a call and be able to answer whatever questions you may have. So um, that, that is definitely the best way to get a hold of us. Um, I think that's it. Though. I think we've answered most. Of, oh, let's see. We got one more that came in. Uh, let's see. Let's say I purchase a flip and a flip, fix it up, do a cost seg study. Um, I'm going to stop right there because typically on fix and flips, if you don't ever put them into service, you can't take depreciation, which means you can't do a cost seg study. So those are treated as inventory, which is a little bit different. So I'm going to back up and say you can take depreciation if you ever make it a rental. So sometimes people will fix and flip, turn it into a rental for a year to get the depreciation out of it and then sell it after that. But if you're strictly fixing or buying it, fixing it up and flipping it, you don't ever get to take depreciation on it because it's never technically in service as a rental property. Um, but I'm going to keep on, let me just keep on here and see if I can answer. If I sell the asset two years later, Okay, so if you buy it as a fix and flip, do a cost seg study, take the depreciation, and then sell it two years later, do I have to pay capital gains at 15%? Does it make sense to do the cost seg study? Because when I sell it, I have to recapture the depreciation at a rate of 25, which is more than just taking the capital gains at 15. So it de that's a great question. It depends on your tax bracket. So let's say I'm in a, let's say I make $500,000 a year, that puts me in a 37% tax, but let's say I make 600, I think it's like 530. Let's say I make $600,000 a year, so that puts me in the highest tax bracket. That means I'm gonna pay 37% federal tax rate. I would do this, I would buy a property, I would take my 100% bonus, I would reduce my 600,000 of income at 37%, and then in two years later, when I pay it back, I'm paying it back at both the capital gains rate of either 15 or 20%, at a recapture rate of 25% and I'm saving the spread. So again, it depends on your tax bracket, number one. Number two, it depends on how long you own it because remember, you're not paying it all back. So it's not just a rate arbitrage, you know, the difference between the rates, but part of it is you're paying a portion of it back at the lower rates. And so remember, if you've owned it for two years, then you're only paying back three fifths of your five-year asset and five sevenths of your seven-year asset. So you're not paying back the full amount. So take the deduction at the highest rate, pay back a portion, or excuse me, take the deduction at a high rate, pay back a portion at a lower rate at a future date and save the spread. And that portion is dependent upon how long you own the asset. The longer you own it, the smaller that portion is. And so it actually makes sense. We sometimes, Don, it makes sense. You could buy, if you're in a high tax bracket, you could buy a property in December, put it into service, sell it in January. So it's on two different tax returns and it would absolutely make sense to do a cost seg study. And that's simply because of the rate arbitrage, you know, on some of the larger properties. So um, definitely worth having somebody run the analysis. Um, but uh, yeah, definitely want to look into that. 
Okay, we've got a comment from Aziz, our favorite pastor in Pennsylvania. He says, I'm Eric's satisfied client. <laughs> I've seen spectacular tax savings. He's the real deal. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Nazi. You just got a discount on your next cost study. So <laughs> <laughs> that was unsolicited. I appreciate that. <laughs> thanks. Thanks, buddy. Um, did we get to... I, I, I'm, I'm, <laughs> Please put your questions in the Q and A screen. It's just, it, it, it's. I'm not sure we're getting to everybody that's over in the chat screen, but we're trying. Um, yeah. Did we get to Teresa's question at the bottom of the Q and A? Um, let's go back to the Q and A here. Give me one second. <laughs> um, what if I have to repair and improve an inherited rental before selling it? Tax consequences of this plus capital gains on sale. What if I have to repair and improve an inherited property or inherited rental before selling? So you're going to, if you inherit a property, you get a step up in basis, which is great. Then you would, if you have to repair or improve, like Don said, some of that stuff is going to, as long as the property's in service, some of it's going to be expensed um, immediately. Some of it's going to have to be capitalized. Um, and there wouldn't be any tax consequences. I don't know that you would do a cost egg study if you don't put it into service. So if you inherit a property and you just fix it up, let's say it's vacant when you inherit it and you fix it up to sell it, there's no tax consequence. You wouldn't want to do a cost sake study because you've never put it into service. Remember, in order to do a cost sake study, the property has to be in service, meaning that it has to be available for its intended use or purpose. So that's a rental property or a revenue generating property. If you're just inherit a property, fix it up and sell it, then there's no, no reason to do a cost sake study. I don't know if I answered that. Yeah, no. unless I inherited it five years ago and now I'm fixing it up now. Right. Um, but if you inherited this year, uh, your capital gains is, is really low, unless you're putting a lot of money into it. Right. It wouldn't make sense to do the cost set. And, and he's right. Even, even the repairs, the, the building has to be in service, meaning available for use by December 31st to right. claim all the repairs and the cost set this year. That's correct. Okay. Yep. I think we've asked it. Can you give me... Um, Don, I think I'll let you answer the question in the chat. Someone says they need advice in all areas. Don's the uh, the king of connections, so I'll let Don answer that. <laughs> um, he can lead um, you in the right direction there. So we at, at the last summit, uh, we had a really good deal from um, Tax Hive, and they said, "Let let us review your last year's taxes. If we can't find." Um, $10,000 of missed deductions, we'll pay you $100. And so for that, go back and look at our, on, on the, if you're looking for somebody really good to do your taxes, Tax Hive is really a good company. I, I've, I've, I've worked with a lot of their accountants for several years. Go back and look at our YouTube channel and the interview that I had with Kevin O'Leary, you know, the bald guy, Mr. Wonderful from Shark Tank. And that was some really good information for investors. But the last little bit was, yeah, it's a little promo for, for Tax Hive, a company that he is a, a co-owner of. Um, I think that would be the best place. A, a CPA who can look over your whole tax situation it, it's really hard at, on our asset protection hotline to give tax advice because we're shooting, we can answer questions, but not specific because we don't see the whole picture. Yeah, and Did I'll we get any other questions, questions or is that? No, I was just going to add to that, Don. Um, you know, one thing about being in this business and working with real estate investors and working with different CPAs, and we touched a little bit about this, Don, when we first got on the call today, um, but there's a difference between a tax preparer and a tax advisor. And as you start to invest in real estate, it's really important to get a tax advisor. You know, we can all do our own taxes on TurboTax, or we can go to Walmart and have H&R Block do our taxes, but those are tax preparers. And all they do is they take the data that you give them, they input it in their software and it spits out a return. And so it's just a, it's a, um, what am I trying to say? It's just a function of, it's just a task that they're doing. Versus a tax advisor who you meet with quarterly to say, hey, here's what I plan on buying. Here's what I plan on selling. Here's what my expected income is going to be this year. What do I need to take into consideration to lower my tax liability? 
And there's all kinds of stuff. The last thing you want to do is meet with your CPA or your tax preparer in March, right before you file your taxes. You should be meeting with them all throughout the year because there's things that you need to do and set up that reduce your tax liability. And so, again, I, I've seen the good, the bad, and the ugly in some of this stuff. And, and the only thing I'll add to that, Don, is, is please, it's worth every dollar that you pay a good qualified real estate CPA um, because you know, a lot of us will use CPAs who don't necessarily specialize in real estate. And so they don't know all the tax laws and all the nuances that are available to you. And so just that, that would be my only word of advice is just as you're looking for CPAs, get with somebody who really understands real estate um, and is really a, an advisor versus somebody who just prepares your taxes once a year. In fact, I'd go even further than that. I'd say if your CPA is not investing in real estate, he doesn't understand real estate. If, if your stock market, if, if your CPA, if you're investing in the stock market and uh, not inside of an IRA, because that's a tax-free environment, but if you're investing in the stock market and, you're, and your CPA doesn't invest in the stock market, I, I don't care how many tax returns he does. He doesn't get, he, he's not in the game. This is one of the things that Kevin O'Leary talked about, and he was pretty blunt. He, it was the difference between a tax preparer and a tax advisor. Right. And, and he's saying, you look, I, 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 I meet I, at least monthly with my tax advisor. I don't like any of them. You don't <laughs> hire a ta tax advisor because they have a personality, but, <laughs> but they've so, saved me millions of millions of dollars right. and, and they can steer me rather than, just a tax preparer to put in all the right information in the right little boxes after the damage is done. Right. You, you need somebody that can help you sit down and strategize. And what if I do it this way? And what if we have a, a C corp instead of an S corp? And what if we have changed right. it to from a sole proprietorship or what, how much more could we contribute? If we had a C corp, how much more could we contribute to our IRA and let the IRA buy the real estate? Oh, that's tax free environment. <laughs> it, it, it's a matter of sitting down. We only know what we, we, we know. And if we don't know it, that's why we, we, we have to have good advisors on this. I, Eric, I absolutely appreciate what you're saying. And, and for real estate, Eric and his group are some of the best tax advisors we can give you. So in your, in your chat screen, I put, if, if you don't want to type in, protectwealth.com forward slash COTSEG. It's a clickable link. Just click on it and it'll take you there. Um, but sign up for that and, and sign up. As long as they have their your contact information, um, they, can, they can get back with you and answer questions. Yeah. Any closing comments, Eric? No, no, that's really, I, I think you hit it on the head. I, I just appreciate being here. Hopefully, um, the information we discussed was valuable to those listeners. Um, again, please use this as a resource. I always kind of close with this story that we we want to be there to help you with depreciation. I think the weirdest question I've been asked is how to depreciate deer in a breeding farm in Wisconsin. So um, <laughs> it's one of these farms where they breed these massive bucks that people can go pay all kinds of money and shoot these bucks in a farm. But um, anyways, we got asked that. I didn't know the answer to that, but I knew somebody who would in our company. And so we were able to get the answer. So please feel free to give us a call. Um, use this as a resource. Like Don said, we work with a number of real estate investors across the country. We see um, all the ins and outs of what different CPAs are doing. You know, CPAs all do things a little bit different. And so we kind of have some best practices there. And so like Don said, fill out the form. We'll get some information over to you. And then um, we'll be able to, to hopefully answer your questions or help you out any way possible. So Thanks again, Don. Eric, thank you um, for being here. And especially those of you on the East Coast, we know it's late. We'll, we'll let you get off. Um, thank you for being here, all of you. Um, we've got a webinar. Do we have one next week? Uh, you'll watch our webinar schedule because I think the next one is on intellectual property. If you have any intellectual property at all, don't miss that one. That, that'll be good. Our, our summit is coming up in, I don't know, uh, April, right after tax day, I think the 25th. Um, okay. Until then, Eric, uh, awesome information. Appreciate uh, you. Thanks. Don. thanks Have buddy. a great one. Have a good night. Yeah. Good night. Bye-bye.